Right, oh, welcome back, everyone. Um, so, another uh, series of uh, webinars uh, uh, organised by the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland um, with the uh, help of National Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, uh, and the aim of, of this series of webinars and, uh, and workshops is to uh, encourage the study of aquatic plants. Uh, which have a reputation of being a little bit more difficult to, to do uh, for, from some of the, the terrestrial plants. Um, uh, and uh, in a lot of cases, there are, there are some difficult things as in, as in terrestrial plants, but, but uh, on the whole, aquatic plants are not particularly difficult. Um, uh, and this is one of a series of, of webinars uh, looking at particular groups and just hopefully helping to make them more accessible. Uh, this one, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, milfoils and hornworts. Um, and uh, um, they're two completely unrelated families of aquatic plants. Um, uh, they uh, are uh, more or less in, in their own genera. Um, Ceratophyllum has its own family. Uh, Myriophyllum is in uh, Halorogacy, uh, which uh, Halor Haloraga uh, is a, a, a southern hemisphere uh, genus. Um, so, from from the British and Irish point of view, it, it's sort of uh, uh, the the only members of uh, of that family are, are very often. Uh, and we're discussing them together because of the similar arrangement and form of the leaves i.e. they're in, in whirls and they're divided into linear segments, uh, which uh, I, I tend to use the, uh, the term feathery uh, for uh, the, these uh, uh, aquatic plants that have compound leaves of, of, of linear segments. Um, uh, and in this sort of feathery group, uh, one of the uh, uh, key things that you look at to separate the different genera, uh, uh, firstly, is uh, uh, whether the, the leaves are alternate, uh, whether they're staggered on the stem, like uh, water crowfoots, ranunculus, uh, or in this case, uh, the milfoils and the hornworts, uh, they are in worms. Um, I'll come to uh, uh, water vials a bit later. I, I, I include or mention this uh, uh, as well, just because it very often the uh, it looks sort of very superficially like a mill farm. Um, so uh, the the other key feature that you look at in these feathery leaf things is the way the leaves divide. Um, so in ceratophyllum. Uh, the divisions is, is fork divisions uh, with sort of equal strength to each of the divisions, uh, whereas in milfoils, uh, the divisions are, are like feathers, um, so a sort of pinnate division with, with a, a midrib uh, and, and side, side filaments. Um, uh, water violet, I mentioned, um, uh, the leaves are actually staggered, but sometimes you'll find parts of the stem where they're more or less together um, uh, and, and look almost whirled. Uh, sometimes uh, could could say that they, they're, uh, that they are whirled leaves, but they are actually staggered. Uh, but the main thing that separates water violet uh, is that the, the leaf segments are flattened. So, uh, the, uh, whereas in the milfoils, uh, the leaf segments are capillary, they're sort of circular and cross section. And also, uh, water violet has nice showy flowers, which, uh, but they're not always present, but uh, uh, that's very distinct. Um, uh, another group that you could confuse with this, they've got whirled uh, leaves. Uh, are, are the stoneworts. Um, uh, and this is one that I have come across occasionally people confusing uh, uh, some of the stoneworts uh, uh, with hornwort. And you can see that uh, there is a similarity. They've got sort of fork divisions. Um, and uh, uh, certainly uh, 
uh, could be confused, but the cell structure is very different, uh, particularly the nitella, uh, that is all one cell. Uh, from uh, each internode is a single cell, um, and each of these internodes is a single cell, whereas the hornets have a much more complex, they've got a vascular system, uh, a much more complex cell structure. Um, uh, also, um, in cars, another group of, of the, the stoneworts, um, you can have little spines, uh, sort of the bracts, they're, they're called, uh, coming off uh, uh, along the uh, what appear to be leaves. Um, and you could interpret that as a, as a pinnate division, a bit like a milfoil. But again, the structure of them is, is much more um, um, larger cells, no vascular system. Um, and of course, the uh, most distinct thing about stoneworts uh, are that they have these very unique uh, fruiting structures. This is the male here uh, and the female with these spiral cells uh, around, around the spore. Um, but superficially, you could group them in the, in, the, in the same thing because they have leaves or what appear to be leaves uh, uh, that are in whorls. Um, now, book-wise, I am going to say don't use the standard floors. Um, I'll come to this later, but the, both the standard floors, uh, a lot of the books use a character which is uh, they give far too much strength to a particular character, which is the number of leaves in the world, which is a completely uh, unreliable character. Uh, so you're very likely to be led astray if you use the, the standard florals. Uh, ones I would recommend, there's a good uh, bit in Plant Crib, um, uh, which is a BSBI uh, publication. Uh, also, this book by Richard Lansdowne, which is uh, directed at, at particularly river, river plants, um, uh, but it covers uh, standing waters, most uh, uh, species as well. Uh, and there's quite a good section on, on, on the milfoils and, and the homelets there. Um, also available uh, in, uh, on the Aquatic Plants website, there are a number of keys which I've developed over the years, um, uh, which uh, uh, I hope are quite useful for uh, aquatic plants. They're designed to fit onto an A4 sheet um, so you can laminate them and take them out in the field. Um, and it, this, the, the one for milfoils, there isn't one for hornworts, uh, uh, but there, there is one for milfoils, and it just sort of sets out the, the characters. That, that you use for separate. Um, but there are, you'll find there on the website, there are a number of keys for different aquatic uh, genera and different sort of leaf form uh, uh, of aquatic. So there's a, a key to feathery leaves, uh, aquatics, uh, and there's this one for milfoils. Um, so uh, we'll tackle the hornworts first because there are only two of them, so it's a fairly uh, simple group. Um, uh, so the leaves are whirled uh, and they have fork divisions. Um, they also uh, are useful other character which sort of separates them from say a nitella uh, of the stoneworts uh, as are these teeth uh, on the outsides of the leaves, particularly in the the common one, uh, but they, they all, both species have them um, uh, and are, are fairly distinctive. Uh, I am not quite sure if these are the horns for that make it a hornwort, or it could be that sometimes the fruits of, <coughs> of hornworts have a quite a long spike sticking out of them, which might be the horn. Not quite sure where the origin of the name is, but I've actually tended to assume that it's, it's these teeth, these rather stiff teeth, which are the horns. They do look a bit antler-like. Um, so you've got the two species, there's Ceratophyllum submersum and Ceratophyllum demersum. Uh, and the common one is demersum, and it's simply the number of times the leaves divide. So 
uh, in Demersum. If you start at the stem here, you got one division. Uh, sometimes you get two divisions. So if it's one to two, do it. So yeah, here we've got one division there, second division there. One to two divisions makes it Demersum. Uh, three to four divisions, uh, uh, it makes it submersum. Um, there is one thing I would just give a, a word of warning. This doesn't look a whole lot different from the fan leaved water crowfoot in terms of uh, the sort of number of times the leaves divide and the leaves are uh, in, in a whirl that's all in one plane. But with the water, the fan leaf water crowfoot, which is actually circinatus, you would only have one point of attachment for all the leaf in that whirl. Whereas uh, in, in the hornworts, uh, you've got individual leaves coming off, uh, uh, several in each whirl. But I have been caught out myself by sort of seeing something that looks a bit, a bit whirled like this, but sometimes the leaves of the fan leaf water crowfoot can almost go all the way around the stem. Um, in, in terms of, of uh, size, submersum tends to be a bit bulkier because it's got more uh, leaves and those tend to be a bit longer. It tends, it's called soft uh, hornwort because it tends to be floppier. Uh, often uh, demersum is quite a rigid thing, which hence the name rigid hornwort, but they're not always rigid. This can be quite floppy in certain conditions. Um, uh, they do flower, but the flowers are pretty, uh, uh, quite unusual, they do, uh, particularly in, in the common hornwort, the, the, the rigid hornwort, um, uh, and they're not particularly useful for identification. Uh, but uh, distribution-wise, um, demersum is much more common. Um, it's uh, a eutrophic species, it's very, uh, it can tolerate a lot of nutrients and is actually often an indicator of enrichment, but particularly if it's in, in any quantity, it's often a bad sign in terms of uh, indicating that there's nutrient enrichment problems. Uh, and for that reason, it's still, it's very common uh, throughout a lot of England, uh, but it's, still quite rare, particularly in Ireland, particularly over in the west of Ireland. Uh, there are really quite a rather limited number of records, uh, but it is on the increase, uh, uh, I'm, I'm afraid to say, uh, because of increased enrichment. Uh, similarly in Scotland, uh, it, it, it becomes pretty rare in the Highlands, but it is beginning to appear in even quite some remote places um, because, of, because of enrichment problems. Uh, submersum, on the other hand, is a much more localized thing. Um, uh, it, it's, it, there are a few areas where it's a bit more common, uh, often near the coast, particularly on, you can see on the east coast uh, of East Anglia, that there's quite a bit of it in, in sort of grazing marshes uh, uh, in the coastal strip. Um, in Ireland, it's uh, much, much rarer and it's a protected species. Um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, and confined to the east coast. Moving on to the milfoils, um, there are three native species. Um, one common introduction, which is actually a pest. Uh, there are two other species that have been recorded for quite short periods uh, uh, in England as introductions. I'm not going to say any more about those uh, because they're, they're no longer present. Uh, so I'm just going to concentrate on these four species. Um, uh, and uh, the millfold characters that leaves a world, uh, but rather than being forked as in the hornworts, uh, it's pinnate divisions like feathers. Um, and uh, this is, uh, don't worry about the detail of this, this is actually uh, the, the table that's, that's on the handout that I, uh, it, uh, the uh, key that's on the Aquatic Plants website that I showed you earlier. But 
I, I wanted to highlight here uh, is this, this character here, the number of leaves in the world, which is used in, uh, as an important character, I think in, in Stace, for example, it's the first question is the number of leaves in the world um, with other characters, but, it, but it's given quite considerable prominence um, and uh, is not a good character. You can see that the ranges can overlap quite widely uh, between the different species. Um, and uh, I, I believe that, um, uh, you see, I think that what they tend to say is that Verticillatum has five leaves in the well and Spicatum has four leaves in the well. Um, and no, Verticillatum can have four leaves in the well as well, uh, just as much as, I mean, Spicatum tends to have four, but it's by no means restricted to that. Um, and I suspect that quite a lot of misidentifications have, have derived from this, the prominence given to this character. Uh, so um, uh, don't use that as a character, even despite what it says in, in, in the florals. Um, just a, a comment to make here uh, it is the best place to look for some of these measurements of uh, number of leaflets is in the middle of the stem. Um, uh, leaves that are close to the flowers and leaves that are on sort of dress material tend to be sort of stiffer and fewer, uh, fewer number of leaflets on them. Uh, so you're best to find a nice sort of well-grown stem and find it uh, uh, and look in the middle of that uh, for, for these characters, these measurements. Um, uh, so if we deal with alternate flora and spicatum, the, the alternate flowered and, and spiked milfoils, uh, the main differences are the number of leaflets on each leaf. Um, leaf length is not really important in these ones, but it comes in when we start talking about verticillation. Um, uh, but the number of, of, of leaflets is uh, a, a good starting guide uh, as to which species you'll see that there is a little bit of overlap. Uh, uh, and, and there may be occasions when you can't 100% decide and, uh, and the best thing to do in that case is just keep looking and find something that's convincing in, in one or other of the ranges. But you'll also notice that the leaves are much finer in alternate form. Um, the, the, the thickness, it, there is a difference in the thickness of the leaflets. Um, quite difficult to quantify and, and use as a, as a field character. But the effect of this uh, is that um, spicatum is much more rigid um, because the, the, the individual filaments of the leaf are, 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 are wider. Uh, and it means that if you pull it out of the water, uh, it still maintains a bit of the form of, of sort of damp feathers. Uh, whereas very often, would just completely collapses because the, the individual leaflets are much finer uh, and you get an effect like a paintbrush or a cat's tail. Um, uh, different people use different terms for it, but, but it, it just sort of collapses into a sort of, uh, into a sort of cylindrical tube, whereas the inspicatum you've got much more of a sort of stiff a, a, a feather-like appearance. But as I said before, be careful, terrestrialized material tends to have stiff leaves. Um, so you, you best to find sort of good aquatic material to, to look at. Um, color is useful in one way, uh, in that spicatum always has brown colors, uh, particularly on the stem, quite often the stems of spicatum are, co are quite uh, reddish or brownish, quite strongly so. Um, Alterniflorum is often green, but it can also be brown or red. So uh, uh, you, if, if it's green, then you know it can't be spicatum, but you, uh, if, you, if it's got brown or red colors, then uh, it could be either. So uh, you can use it one way, but not the other. Um, the other thing to note here is that that spicatum particularly tends to have gaps between the, uh, the leaves that tend to be shorter than the internodes um, uh, or about equal to the internodes. Um, 
and um, uh, uh, alternative forum also tends to be uh, they tend to be overlapping a little bit, but uh, we, we can come to this Virtus Latum, the, the world mill foil, in, in a moment. And there you'll find that this internode, the leaves are much longer than the internodes, and there's quite a lot of overlap between the leaves. So essentially, between uh, alter, alternative forum and spicatum, uh, the number of leaflets, the stiffness of the leaves, uh, color to some extent. Uh, are the main characters that you use to separate. Um, so verticillatum uh, tends to be a bigger thing. It has longer leaves. Uh, the number of leaflets is not a whole lot different from spicatum, um, but the actual leaf length tends to be longer and they tend to be distinctly longer than the interlodes. So you're getting overlapping um, uh, leaves uh, overlapping quite a lot. They're also, which I've forgotten to write here, uh, they tend to be much more floppy. Uh, so they tend to collapse uh, uh, much more than, than the spicatum uh, into just a sort of a, uh, a, a sort of paintbrush effect is what we're talking about. Um, the leaves of Virtus Latum are pretty much always greenish. Uh, you can sometimes have a little bit of color, but but essentially it's a green plant. Uh, so that tends to be a big help um, when separating from spicatum because spicatum always has that brownish colors um, and uh, much more space between the leaves and more rigid leaves, uh, whereas lotus latum tends to be uh, green leaved and much more floppy with overlapping leaves. Uh, another really useful character is these uh, verticillatum produces these um, turions. These are sort of overwintering buds. So when the rest of the plant rots away over the winter, you're just left with these sitting on the mud. Uh, and when, when the water starts warming up in the spring, uh, it'll sprout from these, which are, are basically like dense bits of stem and leaves. Um, and it's a, a feature of a number of aquatic plants produce these, these overwintering buds, they're called chirions. Um, and in the milfoils, vertislatum is the only one that does that. Spicatum and Altelliform don't produce these chirions. So if you, and, and they're very obvious, these chirions, they're sort of uh, often uh, a centimeter, two centimeters long uh, and rather sort of bullet shaped. Um, and if you see them, then you know that it's versus latent because the other two don't have them. Um, uh, flowers, if you have them, can be used, but usually you don't need that. You've already decided from uh, the vegetative material. Uh, but uh, so alternate florum has staggered uh, uh, pairs of, of flowers, uh, spicatum. Uh, this is where the where the English names come from. Uh, this has a sort of spike, and, and uh, the, they're in regular whirls of, of four flowers per uh, per whirl in in the spike. Uh, whereas these are alternate; they're sort of staggered. Um, uh, and the world milfoil vitisolatum again it has uh, uh, whirls of, of four flowers. Uh, but they have these uh, pronounced tooth bracts. They're like sort of miniature leaves, and they're not but they're not as divided as the leaves uh, of the um, uh, lower down the stem. Uh, they're sort of they're webbed at the bottom um, with sort of teeth, toothed edges, um, and they're quite prominent on, on versus later. Um, so the fourth one I want to uh, mention is the uh, uh, very invasive um, parrot's feather, uh, which is also very often, uh, but unlike the others, it comes right on out of the water um, and it, it really causes quite severe problems. Um, it's uh, uh, supposed to be illegal to, it's illegal to introduce them into the wild, uh, and they're banned from sale. Um, however, uh, if you go to a lot of garden centers, you will find 
them being sold under the name Brasiliense. Uh, and uh, particularly, uh, there's a, a red stemmed one uh, called Brasiliense red stem. Um, now, there is some debate as to whether this is quite as aggressive and invasive as the, the normal aquaticum. Uh, it seems to be not such a big problem, but it's still the same species, um, even though it's, it's been sold under a different name. Um, and uh, I would still recommend not, not buying it. Um, and probably, probably it needs to be addressed as to uh, because uh, it, it should actually be banned from sale. Uh, these emergent leaves have uh, gland covered um, stems and leaves that are sort of, uh, which makes them unwettable, which is why they sort of stick up out of the water. Um, um, but one thing that isn't quite so recognized is that before it reaches the water surface, it actually produces an underwater form uh, which is not dissimilar from, particularly from verticillatum. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, the leaves are quite long compared to the internodes um, uh, and uh, the number of leaflets and the number of leaves in the world uh, tend to be similar to verticillatum, uh, but it does tend to have brownish stems or a brownish tint tinge right through the uh, sort of green in, in some ways, with, but with a distinct brownish tinge uh, is a good clue for it. But usually it's not a problem because there's plenty of, uh, it, there's plenty of the emergent form um, uh, present in the same lake, uh, often in far larger quantity. Because whenever it reaches, when the, when the plant stems reach the surface, uh, these leaves die off quite quickly. And you're just left with the emergent uh, sort of uh, turquoisey green um, st uh, stems that I sh showed in the previous picture. Um, the, 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 so the issue tends to be uh, not that uh, you just have this on its own, uh, but you might easily think, oh, I've got verticillatum uh, uh, as well in this water body when actually it's all aquatic. So that, that's the problem that you might conf confuse this and record this as verticillatum as well as the aquatic. So distribution wise, um, the alterniflorum is, is essentially a soft water species, uh, whereas uh, spicatum is a calcareous uh, eutrophic uh, brackish water. Uh, and you'll see that the distributions are sort of almost mirror images. So uh, uh, spicatum is the, is the common one in the lowlands of, uh, uh, of all, all countries of, of, of Britain and Ireland, um, uh, whereas Alterniflorum is a much more Western, it's where the, uh, there's more acid geology um, uh, uh, and sort of where the, where the more upland uh, parts of, of the country. So uh, they can occur together. It's actually quite unusual for them to occur together, but they do certainly do do occur together in the same site. Uh, when they do, alterniflorum tends to be in shallower water and dispicatum tends to be in deeper water. Um, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's still relatively unusual that they occur in the same water bodies because of this, this ecological separation. Uh, Vitisolatum, on the other hand, uh, is a much more of a calcareous uh, species uh, uh, and tends to like the water cleaner, um, so not so nutrient enriched. Um, so uh, that's uh, it's quite common in sort of central Ireland. Um, the in the canal systems in the Royal Grand Canal, uh, it was the species that they when they were putting herbicide in the canals that they were mainly trying to control was actually very often verticillatum. Um, so they were putting tons of herbicide on, onto, onto it to try and control it. Um, but in most cases, if you find 
but it's late and it's uh, it's a nice plant to see because it's it's suffering it's 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 been lost from a number you can see from the paleness of, of some of the there's quite a lot of records where it's disappeared uh aquaticum the parrot's feather uh is very much on the increase still quite rare in ireland and in scotland uh it's rare, rarity in Scotland, maybe because it, it might be a bit more frost sensitive. Uh, that might be a limitation on it, or it might be that it just hasn't sort of got into the um, aquatic plant sale system as much as it as it did in England. Uh, but uh, wherever it, it it is, it is a problem species, and often will take over the ponds completely. Uh, and that's it really, uh, just remains to say thanks again to the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland uh, and to the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Yeah.